Hello and welcome to Vanguard Audiobooks. I'm your host, the always congenial Alex P. Linder, coming at you with 50,000 watts of power from vnnforum.com, where we play endless amounts of shit that should have died in the 70s. Because moving forward is failure and stasis is success. Today we're going to deal with a sprightly chapter called Freudianism. Dispen for us by one Francis Parker Yaki. Lo, these many decades ago. Now let us look at the text. We've made it up to page 89 of Imperium by Ulek Farang. The somewhat goofy pen name that Francis Parker Yaki chose. Freudianism. We've already discussed in earlier recorded sessions you can find at vnnforum.com. Marxism and Darwinism. And now we're going to talk about Freudianism. Page 89. As was the case with Darwinism and Marxism, Freudianism has no cultural but only anti-cultural significance. Culture with a capital C. Anti-culture with, again, a capital C. All three are products of the negative side of the civilization crisis, the side which destroys the old spiritual, social, ethical, philosophical values and substitutes for them a crude materialism. And again, he's claiming there are, there are only a handful or eight or nine real original cultures. They're all unique, but they all go through the same stages, even though they might differ in their manifestations somewhat and differ in their uh, expressions. But they go through the same stages, and he's saying the shift is to economic material from artistic, spiritual, religious, philosophical. And civilization is the the portion of culture that he's talking about. And so, destroys the old spiritual, social, ethical, philosophical values and substitutes for them a crude materialism. Do Darwinism, Marxism, and Freudianism. The principle of criticism was the new God to whom all the old values of the Western culture were offered up. The spirit of the 19th century is one of iconoclasm. That is, attacking all institutions in the light of reason. The outstanding thinkers nearly all had their center of gravity on the side of nihilism. Schopenhauer, Hebel, 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 Proudhon, Engels, Marx, Wagner, Darwin, During, Strauss, Ibsen, Nietzsche, Strindberg, Shaw. (laughs) That might be a misprint for Shaw. Some of these were also on the other side of their beings. Heralds of the future, the spirit of the 20th century, which he's a page to contrast with the 19th century. The leading tendency was, however, materialistic, biological, economic, scientific, against the soul of culture man and the hitherto acknowledged meaning of his life. Not on a par with them, but in their tradition, is the system of Freudianism. The soul of culture man is attacked by it, not from an oblique direction of economics or biology, but from the front. So Freudianism is a direct attack on culture man. The science, in quotes, of psychology is chosen as the vehicle to deny all the higher impulses of the soul. On the part of the creator of psychoanalysis, this assault was conscious. He spoke of Copernicus, Darwin, and himself as the three great insulters of mankind, Nor was his doctrine free from the fact of his Jewishness, and in his essay on the resistance to psychoanalysis, he says that it is no accident that a Jew created this system, and that Jews are readily converted to it, since they know the fate of isolation and opposition. Vis-a-vis the Western civilization, Freud was spiritually isolated, and had no recourse but to oppose. Freudianism is one more product of rationalism. It turns rationalism on the soul and finds that it is purely mechanical. It can be understood, and spiritual phenomena are all manifestations of the sexual impulse. But from a scientific point of view, that's absurd, of course. 
This was another one of these marvelous and grandiose simplifications which guarantee popularity for any doctrine in an age of mass journalism. Darwinism was the popular outlook that the meaning of life of the world was that everything was trying to become man-animal, and man was trying to become Darwinian. Marxism, the meaning of all human life is that the lowest must become the highest. Freudianism, the meaning of human life is sexuality, active, optative, conative, or otherwise. All three are nihilistic. Culture man is the spiritual enemy. He must be eliminated by animalizing him, biologizing him, making him economic, sexualizing him, diabolizing him. So you see, Yaki has more of a, basically this is more similar to a Catholic point of view, that man is somewhere between animal and angel and resists all attempts to reduce him. He's a child of God. He has an innate soul and spirit, and he can't be reduced merely to economic or biological sexual, that is, sexual drives. And we can agree with that in terms of man it does seem to be or have something more. Man is, is as they said, as part of the Christian Science Creed, they were excited at the end of the, uh, each uh, Sunday school. Man is not material, he is spiritual. And they say it in that way, not as quite as sillily as I did, but uh, with that tonal sequence of, of uh, emphasis, he is spiritual. And there is something to that, I believe. As people differ, and they have things like lyrical qualities that don't really easily translate into the whirring and stirring of atoms. But again, we we go beyond my pay level. I hate I hate that expression for some reason. But uh, that's above my pay pay uh, pay grade, as they say. Well, that's a, I guess that's an army thing originally. Anyway, these are great simplifications that are popular with journalists. So Jewish pseudo-intellectuals come up with nostrums, that is, patent medicine oils or bogus ideas, snake oil, and then they are vended to the gulping, grasping, goobering public by Jewish liars in the great journals that are the only ones that anyone has access to, even in the age before electronic news, this was true. And the coming of the electronic media, TV and radio only amplified and extended the power of these Jews. Marshall McLuhan is big on everything, all these media as extensions, the human foot, the human ear, the human eye. If you read his books, which were popular and famous back in the 60s, I have most of them. Um, and have read them, actually. Now, this was another one of those marvelous and grandiose simplifications, which guarantee popularity for any doctrine in an age of mass journalism, to repeat what Yaki said. So, reduction of all, everything human to a few simple course drives for money or sex. And this is indeed what you see on any sitcom. People are always shown to betray, be willing to betray their own kind for money. And they're always shown, it's always revealed anytime they suggest a higher motive for themselves that ultimately they're just trying for sex or money. So, yes, this is what we see in popular culture. Jews are always working to degrade white men and to eliminate any vestige of loyalty or prevent it from forming. It's, so it's not just that they simply and crudely destroy society by means of promoting perverse sex. They, destroy, they, they try to destroy all loyalty among competing racial groups, whether to family, to spouse, to neighborhood, to city, or to race. All those loyalties have to be destroyed. Jews alone can have a cohesive, coherent culture. So I would say Yaki is arguing, a, or sounds a Christian plane, although he's not admitting that, and he's not he's coming from a different perspective, but he's saying the same sort of thing they would. And we would know from later decades, in fact, right around the time he was actually writing this work, that the Jews were coming together in the Frankfurt School, and 
describing what they said as the Aryans' authoritarian personality and how it has to be unstrung by promoting promiscuousness in society. But of course they were doing that before the Frankfurt School ever formed. Destroying society through moral looseness is one of their techniques, along with many others. Now, culture man is the spiritual enemy. He must be eliminated by animalizing him, biologizing him, making him economic, sexualizing him, diabolizing him. To Darwinism, a Gothic cathedral is a product of mechanical evolution. To Marx, it is an attempt of the bourgeois to trick the proletariat. To Freud, it is a piece of frozen sexuality. It is both needless and impossible to refute Freudianism. If everything is sex, a refutation of Freudianism would also be sexual in significance. The 20th century does not approach phenomena that have become historical by asking whether they are true or false. To its historical way of thinking, a Gothic cathedral is an expression of the intensely religious, newly awakening young Western culture, which shadows forth the striving nature of this culture soul. In its necessity for self-expression, however, this new outlook must reject the materialistic tyranny of the older, immediately preceding outlook. It must free itself also from Freudianism. This last great attempt to animalize man also uses critical hyphen rationalistic methods. The soul is mechanical. It consists of one simple impulse, the sexual instinct. The whole life of the soul is the process of this instinct getting misdirected, twisted, turned upon itself. For it is elemental to this science that this instinct cannot go correctly. To describe the mechanical functions of the soul is to describe diseases. The various processes are neurosis, inversion, complexes, repression, sublimation, transference, perversion. All are abnormal, unhealthy, misdirected, unnatural. As one of its abecedarian truths, the system states that every person is a neurotic, and every neurotic is a pervert or an invert. This applies not only to culture man, but to primitive man as well. Here Freud surpasses Rousseau, who at the beginning of the early civilization phase of the West affirmed the purity, simplicity, and soul healthiness of the savage in contrast to the wickedness and perversion of culture man. Freud has widened the attack. The whole human species is the enemy. Even if one did not know from all the other phenomenon that the early civilization phase of materialism and rationalism had closed, one would know from this system alone, for such complete nihilism is obviously not to be surpassed, expressing as it does anti-cultural feeling to its uttermost limits. As a psychology, it must be called a pathopsychology, for its whole arsenal of terms describe only aberrations of the sexual instinct. The notion of health is completely dissociated from the soul life. Freudianism is the black mass of Western science. That's a good pull quote right there. Freudianism is the black mass of Western science. Part of the structure of the system is the interpretation of dreams. The purely mechanical workings of the mind, for there is no soul, are shown by dreams. Not clearly shown, however, for an elaborate ritual is needed to arrive at the real meaning. Conscious, conscience censorship, the new name for Kant's moral reason, symbolism, all these in quotes, repetition compulsion, these and many more cabalistic noumena have to be invoked. The original form of the doctrine was that all dreams were wishes. To dream of the death of a loved person was explained by psychoanalysis as latent parent hatred, the symptom of the almost universal Oedipus complex. And we've heard in other things that we've read that uh, that was refuted within the year that he first published it, the Oedipus complex. The dogma that, that it existed among primitive men. The dogma was by anthropologists who knew what they were actually talking about. The dogma was rigid. Thus, if the dream was of the death of a pet dog or cat, the animal was the focus of the Oedipus complex. If the actor dreams of not knowing his part, it shows that he wishes he might sometime be so embarrassed. In order to attract more converts, including those of weaker faith, 
The doctrine was slightly changed, and other dream interpretations were admitted, such as the repetition compulsion, in quotes, when the same fear dream, fear dream hyphenated, when the same fear dream recurs regularly. The dream world, of course, reflected the universal sexuality of the soul. Every conceivable object in a dream was capable of being a sexual symbol. Repressed, quote-unquote, sexual instinct appeared in dreams, symbolizing, transferring, sublimating, inverting, and running the whole gamut of mechanical terminology. Every person is a neurotic in his mature life, and it is no accident, for he became so in his childhood. Experiences in infancy determine, quite mechanically, since the whole process is non-spiritual, which particular neuroses will accompany the person through his life. There is really nothing that can be done about it except to deliver oneself into the care of a Freudian adept. One of these announced that 98% of all persons should be under the treatment of psychiatrists. This was later in the development of the system. At first it would have been 100%, but, as with Mormonism, the original purity of the doctrine was compromised by the elders for reasons of expediency. The average man who is doing his work presents a great illusion to the eye of an observer. It looks as though he is doing what he is doing. Actually, however, as Freudism shows, that he is only apparently doing it, for in actuality he is quietly thinking about sexual matters, and all that one can see is the results of his sexual fantasy sifted through mechanical filters of conscience censorship, sublimation, transference, and the like. If you hope, fear, wish, dream, think abstractly, investigate, feel inspired, have ambition, dread, repugnance, reverence, you are merely expressing your sexual instinct. Art is obviously sex, as are religion, economics, abstract thought, technics, war, state, and politics. Everything is sexual just in a veiled form, it requires a Jewish pseudo-scientific expert to interpret. That ends part one of this chapter. Yeah, the chapters are unnumerated. Two, Freud earned thus, together with his cousin Marx, the order of simplicity. It was the coveted decoration of the age of mass. With the demise of the age of criticism, it has fallen into the discard, for the new outlook is interested not in cramming all the data of knowledge, experience, and intuition into a prefabricated mold, but in seeing what was, what is, what must be. Over the portal of the new outlook is Leibniz's aphorism. The present is loaded with a past and pregnant with a future. The child is fathered in the man. This is ancient wisdom and describes the unfolding of the human organism from infancy to maturity, every stage being related backwards and forwards because one and the same soul speaks at every moment. Freudianism caricatures this deep organic vision with a mechanical device whereby childhood determines the form of maturity and makes the whole organic unfolding into a causal process and what is more, a diabolical, diseased one. So, Freud, like all these Jews, parallel to Einstein, they find something that might even be correct and profound, and they copy it in a debased way and pretend that it's original and some kind of contribution. But it's always untrue no matter how successful they were able to popularize and into being. Insofar as it is Western at all, Freudianism is subject to the prevailing spirituality of the West. Its mechanism and materialism reflect the 19th century outlook. Its talk of the unconscious, of instinct, impulse, and the like, reflects the fact that Freudianism appeared at the transition point in the Western civilization when rationalism was fulfilled and the irrational emerged again as such. It was not at all in the terminology or the treatment of the new irrational elements in the doctrine that Freudianism presages the new spirit, but simply and solely in the fact that irrational elements appear. Only in this one thing does this structure anticipate, in every other way, it belongs to the Malthusian, Darwinian, Marxian past. It was merely an ideology, a part of the general rationalistic, materialistic assault on the culture man. The irrational elements that the system recognizes are subordinated strictly to the higher rationalism of the adept, who
who can unravel them and lead to the suffering neurotic into the light of day. They are, if possible, even more diseased than the rest of the mind complex. They may be irrational, but they have a rational explanation, treatment, and cure. Freudianism appears thus as the last of the materialistic religions. Psychoanalysis, like Marxism, is a sect. It has auricular confession, that means spoken, dogmas and symbols, esoteric and exoteric versions of the doctrine. Remember Leo Strauss and the Jews, that this is the neocon one. There's one truth for the public, which is a big lie, and the real truth, the facts of the matter for the real intentions of the policy for the inside group. Esoteric versus exoteric is for the masses. Esoteric is for the few. So he's saying that Freudism is materialist. It is a materialist religion. It's the last great one. It's a sect, essentially. It has confession, dogma, symbols, eso and exoteric versions of the doctrine, converts and apostates, priests and scholastics, a whole ritual of exorcism, and a lit liturgy of mantle. Schisms appear, resulting in the foundation of new sects, each of which claims to be the bearer of the true doctrine. It is occult and pagan with its dream interpretation, demonological with its sex worship, its world picture is that of a neurotic humanity, twisted and perverted in its straitjacket of Western civilization, toward whom the new priest of psychoanalysis stretches out the hand of deliverance through the anti-Western Freudian gospel. And what does this mean? Well, every time you hear on TV a character say, you need to seek help or you need to get professional help, this is what it means. The Jew will tell you how to act and what's wrong with you and by extension what's wrong with your society and culture. But the Jew is lying. The Jew is self-serving. It's not a mistake that this serves Jewish racial agenda, which is always anti-white, this garbage new religion of Freudianism. The hatred that formed the core of Marxism is present in the newer religion also. In both cases, it is the hate of the outsider for his totally alien surroundings, which he cannot change and must therefore destroy. And here, it really makes me wonder of John Murray Cudahy, who led to my epiphany about the depth of the Jew problem and preceded Kevin MacDonald's work with his own The Ordeal of Civility, makes me wonder if he had read Yaki. Because this is exactly the sort of thing that might have started him thinking that led to his book in the 70s, like two to three decades after Yaki wrote this. So there's at the hatred there's a there's a hatred of the West at the core of both Marxism and Freudianism. Let's read that again. The hatred that formed the core of Marxism is present in the newer religion also. In both cases, it is the hate of the outsider, that is the Jew, for his totally alien surroundings, which he cannot change and must therefore destroy. The attitude of the twentieth century toward the subject matter of Freudianism is inherent in the spirit of the age. Its center is in action, external tasks call to the Western soul. The best will hear this call, leaving those to busy themselves with drawing soul pictures who have no souls. Scientific psychology was always thus. It has never attracted the best minds in any culture. It all rests on the assumption that it is possible by thought to establish the form of what thinks an extremely dubious proposition. If it were possible to describe the soul in rational terms, a prerequisite to a, a science of psychology, there would be no need for such a science. The reason is a part, or better, a partial function of the soul. Every soul picture describes only the soul of him who draws it, and those like him. A diabolist sees things Freud-wise, but he cannot understand those who see things otherwise. This explains the vileness of the Freudianistic attempts to diabolize, sexualize, mechanize, turning men from real men into animals or machines or both, and destroy all the great men of the West. Greatness they could not understand, not having inward experience of it. Soul cannot be defined. It is the element of elements, capital E, Z. Any picture of it, any psychological system, is a mere product of it and gets no further than self-portrayal. How well we understand now that life is more important 
than the results of life. Moving on to page 96. Psychology systems use the terminology in all civilizations of the material sciences of physics and mechanics. They reflect thus the spirit of natural science and take rank therewith as a product of the age. To the higher rank to which they aspired, namely the systemization of the soul, they do not attain. No sooner was Freudianism well established as the new psychoanalytic church than the onward development of the Western civilization made it old-fashioned. The psychology of the 20th century is one adapted to a life of action. To this age, psychology must be practical or it is worthless. The psychology of crowds, of armies, of leadership, of obedience, of loyalty, these are valuable to this age. They are not to be arrived at by psychometric methods and abstruse terminology, but by human experience, one's own and that of others. The 20th century regards Montaigne as a psychologist, but Freud is merely the 19th century representative of the witch obsession of the Western culture in its younger days, which was also a disguised form of sex worship. Human psychology is learned in living and acting, not in timing reactions or observing dogs and mice like Skinner or Wundt, the non-Jew German founder of psychology, which began as like what literally that, studying human reaction, the simplest form of it, physically. The memoirs of a man of action, adventurer, explorer, soldier, statesman, contain psychology of the type that interests in this age, or that interests this age, both in and between the lines. Every newspaper is a compendious instruction in the psychology of mass propaganda, and better than any treatise on the subject. There is a psychology of nations, of, of professions, of cultures, of the successive ages of a culture, from youth to senility. Psychology is one aspect of the art of the possible, and as such is a favorite study of the age. The greatest repository of psychology of all is history. The greatest repository of psychology of all is history. It contains no models for us, since life is never recurring, once happening, but it shows by example how we can fulfill our potentialities by being true to ourselves by never compromising with that which is utterly alien. To this view of psychology, any materialism could not possibly be psychology. Here Rousseau, Darwin, Marx, and Freud meet. They may have understood other things, but the human soul, and in particular the soul of culture man, they did not understand. Systems like theirs are only historical curiosities to the 20th century, unless they happen to claim to be appropriate descriptions of reality. Anyone who believes in, quote-unquote, these antiquated fantasies stamps himself as ludicrous, posthumous, ineffective, and superfluous. No leading men in the coming decades will be Darwinians, Marxians, or Freudians. Well, at least in the sense of Darwin, I think he was wrong, and Marx certainly survives in an altered form. Freud may be dead, but the Sikh help culture is certainly still alive. So, can't say he's wrong, but we can't really say he's right either. Perhaps about the time frame. So, there are many different human psychologies, and we see them in history. Although they're never recurring, they offer examples to us, is what Yaki is saying. And that concludes that chapter. All right, and so we move on to the next chapter on page 98, the scientific technical world outlook. Scientific technical hyphenated and world outlook hyphenated. The scientific technical world outlook. Science is the seeking after exact knowledge of phenomena. In discovering interrelations between phenomena, that is, observing the conditions of their appearance, it feels it has explained them. This type of mentality appears in a high culture after the completion of creative religious thought and the beginning of externalizing. Remember, moving that's another one of the changes, the shift from religious, artistic, philosophical to scientific, material, economic. So the concern moves from the inward to the outward is another way of putting that. This type of scientific mentality, the concern with the external and relations between phenomena and things, appears after the completion of creative religious thought 
and the beginning of externalizing interest in the objects of the world and their relations, whether in science or economics, materialism. In our culture, this type of thinking only began to feel sure of itself with the middle of the 17th century in the classical, in the 5th century BC. The classical is a different culture from the Western culture. The classical would be Rome and Greece. The leading characteristic of early scientific thinking from the historical standpoint is that it dispenses with theological and philosophical equipment, only using them to fill in the background in which it is not interested. It is thus materialistic in its essence, in that its sole attention is turned to phenomena, and not to ultimate realities. To a religious age, phenomena are unimportant compared with the great spiritual truths. To a scientific age, the opposite is true. Technics is the utilization of the macrocosm, it always accompanies a science in its full blooming, but this is not to say that every science is accompanied by technical activity, for the sciences of the classical culture and the Mexican culture had nothing at all which we would call technical proficiency. In the early civilization stage, science predominates and precedes technics in all its attempts, but with the turn of the 20th century, technical thinking began to emancipate itself from this dependence, and in our day, science serves technics and no longer vice versa. In an age of materialism, which is to say an anti-metaphysical age, it was but natural that an anti-metaphysical type of thinking like science would become a popular religion. Religion is a necessity for culture man, and he will build his religion on economics, biology, or nature if the spirit of the age excludes true religion. Science was the prevalent religion of the 18th and the 19th century. While one was permitted to doubt the truths of the Christian sects, one was not allowed to doubt that Newton, Leibniz, and Descartes. When the great Goethe challenged the Newtonian light theory, he was put down as a crank and a heretic. Science was the supreme religion of the 19th century, and all other religions, like Darwinism and Marxism, referred to its great parent dogmas as the basis for their own truths. Unscientific became the term of damnation. From its timid beginnings, science finally took the step of holding out its results, not as a mere arrangement and classification, but as the true explanations of nature and life. With this step, it became a world outlook, that is, a comprehensive philosophy with metaphysics, logic, and ethics for believers. Every science is a profane restatement of the preceding dogmas of the religious period. Now, that's an interesting claim. It is the same cultural soul which formed the great religions that in the next age reshapes its world, and this continuity is thus absolutely inevitable. That's almost like a Marxist claim that it's scientific, and that it must necessarily follow. Let's read this here in this paragraph. Every science is a profane restatement of the preceding dogmas of the religious period. It is the same cultural soul which formed the great religions that in the next great age, or next age, reshapes its world, and this continuity is thus absolutely inevitable. Western science is, as a world outlook is merely Western religion represented as profane, not sacred, natural, not supernatural, discoverable not revealed. And this is kind of a parallel to the social justice or do-gooding or social gospel that the Jew Rothbard talks about that Protestantism degraded into, which we're also discussing uh, an overlapping area in the feminization of American culture, which you can also find at vnmforum.com. So science is the profane or secular representation of former religious ideas, he's claiming. Uh, I don't know about that. Like Western religion, science was definitely priestly. The savant is the priest, the instructor is the lay brother, and a great systematizer is canonized like Newton and Planck. Every Western thought form is esoteric, and its scientific doctrines were no exception. The populace were kept in touch with, quote, the advance of science, unquote, through a popular literature at which the high priests of science smiled. In the 19th century, science accreted the progress idea and gave its own particular stamp to it. The content of progress was to be technical, 
progress was to consist in faster motion, further sound, wider exploitation of the material world ad infinitum. This showed already the coming predominance of technics over science. Progress was not to be primarily more knowledge, but more technique. Every Western worldview strives after universality, and so this one declared that the solution of social problems was not to be found in politics and economics, but in science. Inventions were promised which would make war too horrible for men to engage in, and they would therefore cease warring. This naivete was a natural product of an age which was strong in natural science, but weak in psychology. The solution of the problem of poverty was machinery, and more machinery. The horrible conditions that had arisen out of a machine civilization were to be alleviated by more machines. The problem of old age was to be overcome by rejuvenation. Death was pronounced to be only a product of pathology, not of senility. If all diseases were done away with, there would be nothing left to die from. Racial problems were to be solved by eugenics. The birth of individuals was to be no longer left to fate. <clears throat> Scientific priests would decide things like parentage and birth. No outer events would be allowed in the new theocracy. Nothing uncontrolled. The weather was to be harnessed. All natural forces brought under absolute control. There would be no occasion for wars. Everyone would be striving to be scientific, not seeking power. International problems would vanish, since the world would become one huge scientific unit. The picture was complete and, to the materialistic 19th century, awe-inspiring. All life, all death, all nature reduced to absolute order in the custody of scientific theocrats. Everything would go on this planet just as it went in the picture of the heavens that the scientific astronomers had sketched out for themselves. Serene regularity would reign. But this order would be purely mechanical, utterly purposeless. Man would be scientific only in order to be scientific. That ends the first section of the, uh, th this part, showing the mentality uh, of the age. Something happened, however, to disturb the picture and to show that it, too, bore the hallmark of life. Before the First World War, the disintegration of the psychical foundations of the great structure had already set in. The World War marks, in the realm of science, as in every other sphere of Western life, a caesura. A new world arose from that war. The spirit of the 20th century stood forth as the successor to the whole mechanistic view of the universe and to the whole concept of the meaning of life as being the acquisition of wealth. With truly amazing rapidity, considering the decades of its power and supremacy, the mechanistic view paled, and the leading minds, even within its disciplines, dropped away from the old, self-evident articles of materialistic faith. As is the usual case with historical movements, expressions of a super-personal soul, the point of highest power, of the greatest victories, is also the beginning of the rapid downgoing. Shallow persons always make mistake the end of a movement for the beginning of its absolute dominance. Thus Wagner was looked upon by many as the beginning of a new music, whereas the next generation knew that he had been the last Western musician. The passing away of any expression of culture is a gradual process. Nevertheless, there are turning points, and the rapid decline of science as a world outlook set in with the First World War. The downgoing of science as a mental discipline had long preceded the World War, with the theory of entropy, 1850, and the introduction of the idea of irreversibility into its picture, science was on the road which was to culminate in physical relativity and frank admission of the subjectivity of physical concepts. From entropy came the introduction of statistical methods into systematic science, the beginning of spiritual abdication. Statistics described life and the living. The strict tradition of Western science had insisted on exactitude, in mathematical description of reality, and had hence despised that which was not susceptible of exact description, such as biology. The entrance of probabilities into formerly exact science is the sign that the observer is beginning to study himself, his own form is conditioning the order and describability of phenomena. It's the Heisenberg principle, isn't it? That the mere fact of observation changes the study or the subjects being observed or there's no way to be purely objectively observe what's going on. 
The next step was the theory of radioactivity, which again contains strong subjective elements and requires the calculus of probabilities to describe its results. The scientific picture of the world became ever more refined and ever more subjective. The formerly separate disciplines drew slowly together mathematics, physics, chemistry, epistemology, logic. Organic ideas intruded, showing once more that the observer has reached the point where he is studying the form of his own reason. A chemical element now has a lifetime, and the precise events of its life are unpredictable, indeterminate. The very unit of physical happening itself, the atom, which was still believed in as a reality by the 19th century, became in the 20th century a mere concept, the description of whose properties was constantly changed to meet and prop up technical developments. That is, they revise after the fact, which is clownishness. Formerly, every experiment merely showed the truth of the ruling theories. That was in the days of the supremacy of science as a discipline over technics, its adopted child. But before the middle of the 20th century, every new experiment brought about a new hypothesis of, quote, atomic structure, unquote. What was important in the process was not the hypothetical house of cards which was erected afterwards, but the experiment which had gone before. No compunction was felt about having two theories, irreconcilable with one another, to describe the structure, quote-unquote, of the, quote, atom, unquote, or the nature of light. The subject matter of all the separate sciences could no longer be kept mathematically clear. Old concepts like mass, energy, electricity, heat, radiation merged into one another, and it became ever more clear that what was really under study was the human reason in its epistemological aspect and the Western soul in its scientific aspect. Epistemology, the the idea of the method and grounds of knowledge. What is real knowledge? Scientific theories reached the point where they signified nothing less than the complete collapse of science as a mental discipline. The picture was projected of the Milky Way as consisting of more than a million fixed stars, among which are many with a diameter of more than 93 million miles. This again as not a stationary cosmic center, but itself in motion toward nowhere at a speed of more than 600 kilometers a second. The cosmos is finite, but unlimited, boundless, but bounded. This demands of the true believer, the old Gothic faith again. Credo quia absurdum, I believe, because it is absurd. But mechanical purposelessness cannot evoke this kind of faith, and the high priests have apostatized, that is, abandon their faith. In the other direction, the atom has equally fantastic dimensions. A ten millionth of a millimeter is its diameter, and the mass of a hydrogen atom stands to the mass of a gram of water as the mass of a postcard stands to the mass of the earth. But this atom consists of, quote, electrons, unquote, the whole making up a sort of a solar system in which the distances between the planets is as great in proportion to their mass as in our solar system. The diameter of an electron is one three billionth of a millimeter. But the closer it is studied, the more spiritual it becomes, for the nucleus of the atom is a mere charge of electricity, having neither weight, volume, inertia, nor any other classic properties of matter. In its last great saga, science dissolved its own... So we're all, basically, the world is made up of stuff that appears to be real, but is really just kind of cotton candy-like, and it disappears upon inspection. Maybe it's all some great drama created by some god who has no corporeal or a physical uh, uh, form. It's it's all just someone's idea, is is the way that uh, Twain uh, expressed it in some of his later works. In its last great saga, science dissolved its own psychical foundations and moved outside the world of the senses into the world of the soul. Absolute time was dissolved, and time became a function of position. Mass became spiritualized into energy. The idea of simultaneity was discarded. Motion became relative. Parallels cut one another. Two distances could no longer be said to be absolutely equal to one another. Everything which had once been described by, or had itself described, the word reality, dissolved in the last act of the drama of science as a mental discipline. The custodians of science as a mental discipline, one after another, abandoned the old materialistic positions. In the last act, they came to see that the science of a given culture has as its real object the description 
in scientific terms, of the world of that culture. A world which again is the projection of the very soul of that culture. The profound knowledge was realized through the study of the very matter itself. Pardon me. The profound knowledge was realized through the very study of matter itself that matter is only the envelope of the soul. To describe matter is to describe oneself. Even though the mathematical equations drape the process with an apparent objectivity. Mathematics itself has succumbed as a description of reality. Its proud equations are only tautology, that is, circular. An equation is an identity, a repetition, and its truth is a reflection of the paper logic of the identity principle. But this is only a form of our thinking. The transition from 19th century materialism to the new spirituality of the 20th century was thus not a battle, but an inevitable development. This keen, ice-cold mental discipline turned the knife on itself because of an inner imperative to think in a new way, an anti-materialistic way. Matter cannot be explained materialistically. Its whole significance derives from the soul. And that ends the second part of the chapter. Let's move on to the third. Materialism from this standpoint appears as a great negative. It was a great spiritual effort to deny the spirit and this denial of the spirit was in itself an expression of a crisis in the spirit. It was the civilization crisis, the denial of culture by culture. For the animals, that which appears, matter, is reality. The world of sensation is the world. But for primitive man, and a fortiori, that is even more strongly, for culture man, the world separates out into appearance and reality. Everything visible and tangible is felt as a symbol of something higher and unseen. This symbolizing activity is what distinguishes the human soul from the less complicated life forms. That's an interesting idea. So what everything we see is, is seems to us inherently we sense as a symbol of something else that's really going on. Well, Oscar Wilde would deny that in making his, his witty statements, but... Uh, this is what Yaki is asserting. Man possesses a metaphysical sense as the hallmark of his humanity, but it is precisely the higher reality, the world of symbols, of meaning and purpose, that materialism denied in toto. What was it then but the great attempt to animalize man by equating the world of matter with reality and merging him into it? Materialism was not overcome because it was false. It simply died of old age. It is not false even now. It merely falls on deaf ears. It is old-fashioned and has become the world view of country cousins. Now see, this is Yaki's is very leftist in this regard. He regards that these are old, just what he said there. These are old ideas. It's not that even that they're wrong, they're outdated. Oh my God, this is 2016. That is so 1894. You know, he, he has a lot of that in what he's saying. And we associate that point of view with being wrong. So just keep that in mind as a possible uh, corrective. With the collapse of its reality, Western science as a mental discipline has accomplished its mission. Its byproduct, science as a world outlook, now belongs to yesterday. But as one of the results of the Second World War, there appeared a new stupidity, technics worship, as a philosophy of life and the world. Technics has, in its essence, nothing to do with science as a mental discipline. It has one aim, the extraction of physical power from the outer world. It has, it is, so to speak, nature politics, as distinguished from human politics. The fact that technics proceeds on one hypothesis today and on another tomorrow shows that its task is not the formation of a knowledge system, but the subjecting of the outer world to the will of Western man. The hypotheses that it proceeds on have no real connection with its results, but merely afford points of departure for the imagination of technicians to think along new lines for new experiments to extract ever more power. Some hypotheses are, of course, necessary. Precisely what they are is secondary. Technics is even less capable than science, then, of satisfying the need for a world outlook to this age. Physical power for what? 
Technics is even less capable than science, then, of satisfying the need for a world outlook to this age. Physical power for what? The age itself supplies the answer. Physical power for political purposes. Science has passed into the role of furnishing the terminology and ideation for technics. Technics, in turn, is the servant of politics. And James Burnham, the managerial state, deals with a lot of this. Spengler dealt with it, too. Ever since 1911, the idea of atomic energy has been in the air, but it was the spirit of war which first gave this theory a concrete form with the invention, in 1945, by an unknown Westerner of a new high explosive which depends for its effect on the instability of atoms, quote-unquote. Technics is practical. Politics is sublimely practical. It has not the slightest interest in whether a new explosive is referred to atoms, electrons, cosmic rays or to saints and devils. The historical way of thinking which informs the true statesman cannot take today's terminology too seriously when he remembers how quickly yesterday's was dropped. A projectile which can destroy a city of 200,000 persons in a second, that however is a reality and affects the sphere of political possibilities. It is the spirit of politics which determines the form of war and the form of war then influences the conduct of the politics. Weapons, tactics, strategy, the exploitation of victory, all of these are determined by the political imperative of the age. Each age forms the entirety of its expressions for itself. Thus, to the form-rich 18th century, warfare also was a strict form, a sequence of position and development, like the contemporary music form of variations of the theme. An odd aberration occurred in the Western world after the first employment of a new high explosive in 1945. Essentially, it was referable to remnants of materialistic thinking, but there were also perennially old mythological ideas in it. The idea arose that this new explosive would blow up the whole planet. In the middle of the 19th century, when the railway idea was projected, The medical doctor said that such swift motion would generate cerebral troubles and that even the sight of a train rushing past might do so. Furthermore, the sudden change of air pressure in tunnels might cause strokes. The idea of the planet blowing up was just another form of the old idea found in many mythologies, Western and non-Western, of the end of the world, Ragnarok, Götterdämmerung, Cataclysm. Science also picked up this idea and wrapped it up as the second law of thermodynamics. The Technics worshippers fancied many things about the new explosive. They did not realize that it was no end of a process, but the beginning. We stand at the beginning of the age of absolute politics, and one of its demands is naturally for powerful weapons. Therefore, Technics is ordered to strain after absolute weapons. It will never attain them, however, and any belief that it will stamps its possessor as simply a materialist, which is to say, in the 20th century, a provincial. Technics worship is completely inappropriate to the soul of Europe. The formative impulse of human life does not come from matter now any more than it ever did. On the contrary, the very way of experiencing matter and the way of utilizing it are expressions of the soul. The naive belief of technics worship that an explosive is going to remake the Western civilization from its foundations is a last dying gasp of materialism. This civilization made this explosive, and it will make others. They did not make it, nor will they ever make or unmake the Western civilization. No more than matter created the Western culture can it ever destroy it. No more than matter ever created the Western culture can it ever destroy it. It is still materialism to confuse a civilization with factories, homes, and the collectivity of installations. Civilization is a higher reality, manifesting itself through human populations, and within these, through a certain spiritual stratum, which embodies at the highest potential the living idea of the culture. This culture creates religions, forms of architecture, arts, states, nations, races, peoples, armies, wars, poems, philosophies, sciences, weapons, and inner imperatives. All of them are mere expressions of the higher reality, and none of them can destroy it. The attitude of the 20th century towards science and technics is clear. It does not ask them to furnish a world outlook. This it derives elsewhere. It positively rejects any attempt to make a religion or a philosophy 
out of materialism or atom worship. It does, however, have a use for them in the service of its unlimited will to power. The idea is primary, and in actualizing it, superiority in weapons is essential. In order to compensate for the immense numerical superiority of the enemies of the West, and that ends uh, that particular chapter. Again, emphasizing materialism is wrong. It's the soul that produces the culture. The culture is at the heart of everything and determines all the forms of whichever particular civilization or, or culture it is, whether the Mexican or the classic or the Western or the Chinese or whatever. Whatever of the eight or nine he talks about that he gets from Spengler. Now moving on to the to the last one we'll cover today, the imperative of our age. And this on starts on page 110. The imperative of our age. By surveying the entire previous happening of the world, Western man understands himself in his 20th century phase. He sees where he stands. He sees also why it was that he was impelled to orient himself historically in italics. His inner instinct forbade that he distort history in the materialistic fashion by subjecting it to an ideology of some kind. He sees the ages of previous cultures to which his present phase is related. The, quote, period of the contending states, unquote, in the Chinese, the transition to Caesarism in the Roman, the Hyksos era in the Egyptian. None of them are ages of the flowering of art or philosophy. All have their center of gravity in politics and action. They are the periods of large space thinking, of the greatest deeds, of external creativeness, of the highest possible magnitude. Philosophers and ideologists, world improvers and art traders, slip down to the street level in these ages when the imperative is directed to action and not to abstract thought. Because of his historical position in a civilization at the beginning of its second phase, his soul has a certain organic predisposition, and the custodians of the idea, capital I, of this time, will of necessity think and feel thus and not otherwise. It can be definitively stated what this relationship is to the various forms of human and cultural thought and action. To religion, this age is once more affirmative, the very opposite of the negative atheism of materialism. Every man of action is in constant contact with the unforeseeable, the imponderable, the mystery of life, and this precludes a laboratory attitude on his part. An age of action lives side by side with death and values life by its attitude toward death. The old Gothic religious idea is still with us. It is at his last moment that a man shows what is in him in his, its purity. Though he may have lived a wastrel, he may die a hero, and it is this last act of his life that creates the image of him that will survive in the minds of his descendants. We cannot possibly value a life according to its length, as materialism did, or believe in any doctrine of immortality of the body. Between his earthly task and his relationship to God, there is no conflict for Western man. At the beginning of a battle, it is the custom of soldiers to pray. The battle is the foreground. That toward which the prayer is directed is the transcendent, is God. Our metaphysical imperative has, has to be fulfilled within a certain life framework. We have been born into a certain culture at a certain phase of its organic development. We have certain gifts. These condition the earthly task which we must perform. The metaphysical task is beyond any conditioning, for it would have been the same in any age anywhere. The earthly task is merely the form of the higher task, its organic vehicle. To philosophy, the spirit of the age has its own attitude, different from all previous centuries. Its great organizing principle is the morphological significance of systems and events. It rests upon no critical method, for all these critical methods merely reflected the prevalent spirit, and its spirit has outgrown criticism. The center of its life thought is in history. By history we orient ourselves. We see the significance of the previous centuries of our own culture. We understand beyond any system or ideology the nature of what we have to do, we see the significance of our own inmost feelings and imperatives. So we place ourselves, see, it seems like he's saying what I like to say, we place ourselves in contact by looking at the history and we see where we are in relation to all that has come before us in the unfolding of our unique culture from inner necessity, which is his theme overall. 
For systems of world improvement, products of a type of thinking which has become old-fashioned, this age has no use. It is interested solely in what must be done and what can be done and not at all in what ought to be done. The world of action has its own organic rhythms and ideologies do not belong to the world of thought. Living ideas interest us, stillborn ideals do not. To art the age can only have one attitude. At best our artistic tasks are secondary. At worst art is degenerated, Hitler's term, to a frightfulness and chaos. Mass clangor is not music. Pictorial nightmares are not even draftsmanship. Again, Guernica, Picasso, Cubism, Abstract Expressionism, let alone the art of painting. Obscenity and ugliness are not culture, Portnoy's complaint, Jew Roth. Materialistic propaganda is not drama. Disconnected words thrown formlessly onto paper are not lyric poetry. Free verse. Whatever art tasks the age has to fulfill will be carried out by individuals acting quietly within old Western traditions, not noising themselves about with journalistic art theories. In an age of action and organization, legal thought reaches a new development. Western law will not stand outside the age of politics with its accompanying thought forms of history and psychology. It will be entirely renewed with these ideas and its old materialism in public law, commercial, and in particular criminal law, will be thrown into the discard. Technics and its handmade science are of high importance to the Western civilization in its present phase. Technics must provide Western politics with a strong fist for the coming struggles. Into the social structure of the Western civilization there will be infused the principle of authority supplanting the principle of wealth. This view is not at all hostile to private property or private management. That belongs to the negative feeling of hatred and jealousy which inform class war, i.e. Marxism. The 20th century idea liquidates class war as it does the idea of economics being the determining force in our life. Economics occupies the position in the new edifice of the foundation and its spiritual importance is indicated thereby. The foundation is not the important thing in a structure, but strictly secondary. But in an age of action, economic strength is indispensable to political units. Economics can be a source of political strength, can serve sometimes as a weapon in the power struggle. For these reasons, the 20th century will not neglect the development of the economic side of life, but will provide it with a new impetus from the now dominant idea of politics. Instead of economics being the sphere wherein individuals battled one another for private spoils, it becomes now a strong and important side of the political organism, which is the custodian of the destiny of all. So economics is, is an arm of the political organism that is the custodian of our culture and our racial destiny. So he's basically advocating a sort of Nazism. That is, Hitler was not against private property. He's saying that the, the economy was meant to serve the state as it protected and advanced the life of the people. <clears throat> the view of the 20th century toward the various directions of thought and action is not arbitrarily any more than that of previous ages was, or is not arbitrary. Most of the best of the 19th century were nihilistic in tendency, sensualistic, rationalistic, materialistic, because the age was one of crisis in the culture life, C.I. Fennell, capital, and these ideas were the spirit of the age. Similarly, the idea of political nationalism was self-evident to that age, but that too was a product of the great crisis, thus a form of disease as destructive as it was necessary. Every juncture of organic happening presents a choice and an alternative. The choice is to do the necessary. The alternative is chaos. This has nothing to do with school book logic. That logic is just one of the numberless products of life, and life will always invent as many logics as it has need for, but life will always obey one logic, one organic logic. This is not describable by any system but can be comprehended by destiny thinking, the only form of thought serviceable to action. Life goes forward or it goes nowhere. 
Opposition to the spirit of the age is the will to nothingness. In the realm of theory, this age has as many alternatives as it has ideologists to dream them up. In the realm of fact, it has only one choice, and that is delineated for it by the life phase of the civilization and the outer circumstances in which we find ourselves at the moment. We know that the transition of one age into the next is gradual, and we know that even as it has fulfilled itself in some directions, it thinks it is just beginning in others. Thus, while science as a mental discipline has achieved its goal, science as a popular outlook for fools and uncreative persons continues to exist. Materialism no longer claims any of the best minds, but the best minds are not in control at this moment. The West is dominated by the outer world in the control of barbarians and distorters, and they find the least valuable minds of Europe most serviceable to them. We think about the riots up in Chicago, attending the... Uh, canceled Trump rally, the violence used, and the way the Jewish media gaslight and claim that Trump caused, well, wait, was Trump throwing punches? Was Trump shooting people and beating people up? No, the people opposed to Trump were doing it. But as always, the media reverse the causality to make the enemies of the Jews appear the bad guys, when in fact, the enemies of the Jews are people resenting Jewish cultural subversion and Jewish attempts to exterminate whites by destroying their culture and inducing a paralysis and fear and confusion and doubt and misery in the white population. Materialism serves the great cause of destroying Europe and that is why it is forced on the populations of Europe by the extra-European forces. There are two ways in which we are sensible of our great task, our ethical imperative which claims our lives, first from our inward feeling which impels us to look at things this way and no other, secondly from our knowledge of the history of the seven previous high cultures, each of which went through this same crisis and each of which liquidated the long civilization crisis in precisely the way that our instincts tell us ours is to be resolved. End section one of this chapter. Section 2. Our momentary situation takes the form of a great battle, a battle which may take more than one war to resolve it, or which may be resolved by a sudden cataclysmic happening entirely unforeseeable to us now. On the surface of history, it is the unforeseen that happens. The most human beings can do is be prepared inwardly. The most human beings can do is be prepared inwardly. In complete contradiction to our instinct, feelings, and ideas, the 19th century sits leering upon the throne of Europe wrapped in the cerements of the grave, and propped up by the extra-European forces. This means that the age in which we find ourselves takes the form of a deep and fundamental conflict. These ideas can never live again. Their supremacy merely means the strangulation of the young, living tendencies of the new Europe. Their supremacy simply consists in forced lip service to them. They do not affect the action thinking, the organic rhythms of the age. They are merely instruments of thwarting the will of Europe by holding in subjection to the least valuable elements in Europe who are maintained in power by extra-European bayonets. The conflict is far-reaching. It affects every sphere of life. Two ideas are opposed, not concepts or abstractions, but ideas which were in the blood of men before they were formulated by the minds of men. The resurgence of authority stands opposed to the rule of money order to social chaos, hierarchy to equality, socio-economic political stability to constant flux, glad assumption of duties to whining for rights, socialism to capitalism, ethically, economically, politically, the rebirth of religion to materialism, fertility to sterility, the spirit of heroism to the spirit of trade, and the principle of responsibility to parliamentarism, parliamentarism, par parliamentarism, 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 the idea of polarity of man and woman to feminism, the idea of the individual task to the ideal of happiness, discipline to propaganda compulsion, the higher unities of family, society, state to social atomism, marriage to the communistic ideal of free love, economic self-sufficiency to senseless trade as an end in itself, the inner imperative to rationalism. But the greatest opposition of all has not yet been named, the conflict which will take up all the others unto itself. This is the battle of the idea of the unity of the West against the nationalism of the 19th century. Here stand opposed the ideas of empire and 
So these are dual conflicting worldviews. Here stand opposed the ideas of empire and petty statism, large space thinking and political provincialism. Here find themselves opposed the miserable collection of yesterday patriots and the custodians of the future. The yesterday nationalists are nothing but the puppets of the extra-European forces who conquer Europe by dividing it. The extra-European forces who conquer Europe by dividing it. Remember, the Protocols talks about dividing Europe by means of ideas. But it can also be divided by means of petty nationalism. I guess that would fall under as a subset of dividing them by ideas. To the enemies of Europe, there must be no rapprochement, no understanding of no union of the old units of Europe in, into a new unit capable of carrying on 20th century politics. So the enemies of Europe do not want to see a united racial Europe, such as Hitler threatened to impose on them with his having one million non-Germans under arms fighting for the Aryan race against the Jewish Bolsheviks. In the previous seven high cultures, the period of the nationalistic disease was liquidated by the spread of one feeling over the whole civilization. It was not unaccompanied by wars, for the past has always and will always fight against the future. Life is war, and to wish to create is to bring about the opposition of the great naysayers, those whose existence is tied to the past, is sunk into the past. The division of the civilization was in each case resolved by the reunion of the civilization, the reassertion of its old original exclusiveness and unity. In each case, from petty statism came empire. The empire idea was so strong that no inner force could oppose it with hope of success. Nationalism itself in Europe transformed itself into the new empire idea after the First World War, the beginning of our age. In each Western country, the nationalists were those who were opposed to another European war and who desired a general political understanding in Europe to prevent its sinking into the dust where it now struggles. They were thus not nationalistic at all, but Western imperial. Remember the name of this book is Imperium. Similarly, the self-styled internationalists were the ones who wished to stir up stir up wars among the European states of yesterday in order to sabotage the creation of the Empire of the West. They hated it because they were alien to it in one way or another, some because they were completely outside the Western culture, others because they were incurably possessed by some ideology or other which hated the new vital masculine form of the future and preferred the old conception of life as money chasing money spending, hatred of the strong, ascendant life, and love of weakness, sterility, and stupidity. And thus the extra-European forces, together with the traitorous inner elements of Europe, were able to bring about a second world war which defeated on the surface the powerful development of Western Empire. But the defeat was, and had to be, and only on the surface, since the decisive impulse, as this century knows once more, comes always from within, from the inner imperative, from the soul, to defeat on the surface the actualization of an idea that is historically essential is to strengthen it. Its energy that would have been diffusing itself outward in self-expression turns inward and is concentrated onto the primary task of spiritual liberation. The materialists do not know what does not destroy makes stronger and destroy this idea they cannot. It uses men, but they cannot use it, touch it, injure it. This whole work is nothing but an outline of the idea of this age, a present of its foundations and universality, and every spiritual root of it will be traced to its origin and necessity. But in this place it should be mentioned that the idea of a universal Europe, an empire of the West, is not new but is the prime form of our culture as of every other. For the first five centuries of our culture there was a <coughs> universal Western people pardon me, in which the local differences counted but slightly. There was a universal king emperor who might have been often defied but was not denied. That it, They might, might have gone against his particular edict, but they didn't deny that he was a legitimate part of the uh, entire system. There was a universal style, Gothic, which inspired and formed all art from furniture to the cathedral. There was a universal code of conduct, Western chivalry, with its honor imperative for every situation. 
There was a universal religion and a universal church. There was a universal language, Latin, and a universal law, Roman law. The disintegration of this unity was slowly progressive from 1250 onward, but was not entirely accomplished, even for political purposes, until the age of political nationalism, beginning around 1750, when Westerners for the first time allowed themselves to use the barbarian against other Western nations. And now, as we enter upon the late civilization phase, the idea of a universal Europe, an empire of the West in the 20th century, emerges once more as the single great formative idea of the age. So a West as a new Roman Empire, not just in the sense that it's, it's an empire and it's universal to the West. It's cross-Western. The form in which the task presents itself is political. It is a power question whether this empire will be established, for strong extra-European forces oppose it, and these forces have divided the soil of our culture between them. Let's repeat that just a little bit. The idea of a universal Europe, an empire of the West in the 20th century st style, emerges once again as the single great formative idea of the age, the idea of an empire of the West. But it's opposed by strong forces and they've divided us. And that ends the second section. Now we have the third and final section, just a couple pages of uh, this chapter. The Empire of the West is a development that no inner European force could possibly oppose with more than token resistance, but its establishment is now crossed by the decisive intervention of outer forces in the life of the West. The struggle is thus spiritual-political, and its motive force derives from the idea of Western unity. At this moment, the existence of the West in freedom for self-development is a function of the distribution of power in the world. The age is political in a sense that no previous Western age has been so. This is the age of absolute politics, for the whole form of our life is now a function of power. Action, to be effective, must be within a spiritual framework. As Goethe said, unlimited activity of whatever kind leads at last to bankruptcy. Our action must not be blind. Our ideational equipment must be of a kind which can turn everything to its own account. It frees itself, therefore, from every kind of ideology, economic, biological, moralistic. It springs directly from the fact sense which this age takes as its point of departure. <clears throat> in the universities and in most of the books, outmoded methods of looking at the field of politics are presented. The doctrine is still taught that there are various forms of government which can be moved about from one political unit to another. There's republicanism, there's democracy, monarchy, and so on and so on. Some of these forms are held out as good, others as bad. It is better to have Europe occupied by the barbarian than to have a Western empire under a bad form of government. And bad and form of government are in different sets of quotes. It is better to eat the rations that Moscow and Washington allow than it is to have, or the rations, than to have a proud and free Europe with a bad government. This is the very height of stupidity. Asininity on this level can only be reached by ideologists without soul and without intellect. This sort of thing is book politics and is traceable to the fact that the world politics has two meanings. It means human power activity and it also has the dictionary meaning of a branch of philosophy. Now if by politics one means a branch of philosophy very well, it can then turn them into whatever one wishes. Carte blanche reigns in the world of philosophy, but the real meaning of the word politics is power activity, and in this sense, acting life it's, is itself politics. Acting life, capital L, is itself politics. In this sense, facts rule politics, and the making of facts is the task of politics. This is the only possible meaning of the word to the 20th century. And this most serious moment of our cultural life demands the utmost clarity of the minds of active men in order that they may be entirely free from any trace of ideology, whether derived from logic, philosophy, or mortality. And thus we stand before the view of politics, which answers the inner demand of the 
age of absolute politics. So we have to have our actions within a spiritual framework that is based upon restoring, regenerating, whatever you want to call it, the uh, culture with a big C that alien outside forces are trying to destroy because they can never be part of it. It's not them, and they seek to dominate it. Anyway, that's enough for today. We've got up to about page 120, and uh, I think that uh, was close to completing. Was that the end of the first section? Let's see. Yeah, that was the end of uh, the first. I, he doesn't call it anything, but there are about one, two, three, four, five, about six major sections of this work. And so we've completed the introduction forward and then the first section, the 20th century historical outlook is what we just completed. The 20th century historical outlook to set us in context. And then next we will deal with roughly equal length section, the 20th century political outlook. We'll pick up with that again next time. I'm Alex Lender. This is VNNForum.com's uh, Vanguard Audiobooks and The Learning College. Placing your life in a white context for the first time ever by reading you and discussing profound, the profoundest material out there. So thanks for listening. I'll be back with you again real, real soon.